Hello and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Nick Smith, the co-founder and CEO of Sportstack. Nick, thanks very much for coming on. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Nick Smith, the co-founder and CEO of Sportstack. Nick, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for having me on, Jake. Nick, very interesting business you've created, very interesting background. So let's talk a little bit about your time and how you got to where you are in the in the betting space and some of the finance stuff before that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, as you say, I've come from a financial markets background before moving into the world of sports betting. I think that speculating in of itself has always been something that's fascinated me in trading generally um, and this ability to express an opinion in a monetary sense um, in, in some form of market has always kind of been my passion, as it were. So that's what naturally drew me into financial markets originally, um, where I ended up trading kind of macro products, mainly FX and currencies, uh, first at Citigroup and then at Goldman Sachs more recently. Um, And then obviously now making the leap into sports betting itself was was really drawn drawn me and my co-founders away from financial markets and into sports markets now is just the sheer maturity and evolution of the space um, from fr- from where it came from maybe 10 years ago to where it is today, led predominantly by, you know, the likes of Betfair that have really driven the market in the, this exchange format and the liquidity that goes with it. Um, and at the same time, actually, the the relative maturity of the financial markets making them you know, significantly more boring or less entertaining than the sports markets are becoming. So it became fairly natural and obvious for myself and some of my co-founders to uh, recognize that whilst we considered ourselves professional gamblers at Goldman, um, simply betting on currencies and interest rates and political events every day, it's far more enjoyable. And, you know, there's a far bigger opportunity actually to translate that into sports itself um, and actually create a product in exchange where one day people can speculate and trade on sports in exactly the same way that they do currently in finance. So there's always famous stories in finance and the culture of potentially having sports betting and pools and, and different things like that. And a lot of people have probably read uh, Trading Bases by Joe Peter, and he talks about some of the things they used to do yeah. back in the day in the U.S. Is, is that a common culture in finance, to have that sports betting, to have that betting and gambling approach like you just mentioned? I think you said that you were betting on probably FX and currency and stuff like that. Is is that something that's normal, or is that isolated in different pockets? No, it's it's very normal. I think anyone that works on the trading floor will, will tell you that. A, a trading floor is exactly that. It's full of people that have significant amounts of capital on behalf of the bank to trade, speculate and bet on whatever products they are experts in. Um, And it really is as simple as that. And, you know, whilst there's obviously many books and movies that slightly dramatize and kind of Hollywood is up (laughs) slightly, generally speaking, you know, that is essentially what you are doing every day. And, you know, it's no, it's no real exaggeration when I say that, we consider ourselves professional gamblers wearing suits um, and our day to day wouldn't look too differently to someone, you know, running a betting syndicate, for example, that does, you know, arguably more analysis and research on the sports events that they put significant money to put to, to bet on is, you know, probably more so some of the time that we would do on some of our currency bets. Um, and I think actually recognizing that um, has always been something that's fascinated me as to why is sports betting considered, especially in the UK, so negatively and have so many negative connotations associated with it when, you know, working from the inside on the financial markets 
spectrum, you really realize that there's very little difference whatsoever to the outside world. Financial markets is obviously given this air of um, superiority and intelligence, which which obviously it's obviously some very smart smart people within the financial markets. But um, the actual fundamentals is that it all comes down to relative probabilities and mathematics, and that applies just as equally to sporting outcomes as it does to financial markets. Um, it's just I think the entertainment concept of gambling and certainly the binary nature of most of the products is what's led. Um, the general perception of gambling and sports betting to be to be viewed so negatively, but fundamentally, I think that has to change, and I think it will change, um, and it's starting to do so. So, tell me about some of the tools and techniques that you developed and learnt and used during your time trading and your time at Goldman that somehow have translated over, or maybe if someone is listening who's sitting at a desk in a suit, betting and trading for a living that they might be doing today, that might be relevant on the sports betting side, whether it's for someone betting professionally or someone like yourself who's getting into the business? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think from from the individual standpoint of someone that's wanting to try and make money in, in sports markets um, as, as a customer, as it were, there's no real difference to trading on a sports exchange as to a financial exchange. Ultimately, whatever price you're looking at, whether that's the price of a stock or the price of the price of Chelsea to win this weekend's match, all that represents is the market's the market's best guess as to the probability of that outcome occurring. Um, and all you need to recognize is where the market price is versus what you think the true value should be. Um, and the difference is obviously the margin you can make if you're correct in that assumption. So much like we would do 24-7 in currency markets, trying to work out where the market was mispriced, that's all an individual re- realistically has to do to succeed in sports sports markets. It's obviously easier said than done. And the more the smarter you are, the more analysis you can do, the more likely you'll be successful. But fundamentally, it's exactly the same thing. I think from an operator standpoint, which is where I am now and where Sportstack is our company, um, there's a lot we can take away from financial markets in terms of understanding the mechanics and dynamics of an exchange, the importance of liquidity, the ecosystem that has to exist to create a successful and functioning marketplace um, in exchange too. And I think coming certainly out of FX currency markets, which are by far the most liquid and largest exchanges in the world, um, gave us a great education and grounding in understanding how to go about creating an exchange of our own and what to focus on and what to prioritize as we do so. So that's been a fantastic education for um, for me, certainly, in terms of bringing that kind of financial markets and exchange knowledge into Sportstack, uh, whilst one of my co-founders is very much on the sports betting side of things, so worked very closely with some of the largest sports betting operations on the tech, tech, uh, on the tech side, um, as well as being a very... Uh, Used used to be a very pervasive user um, of professional user via APIs of the of the largest exchanges too. So from that professional, uh, algorithmic, automated standpoint, uh, we've got a lot of experience there too. So from the founding team's perspective, it all really comes together quite nicely to merge what we've learned from financial markets to what uh, what sports betting exchanges have been doing. Do you have any sense of how beneficial it is to have someone from a different world? Uh, and even though finance is, as we're discussing, heavily connected or there's certainly overlaps, you and your founding team, do you think there's a, a very big advantage to think things through a little bit differently or come from a little bit more of a fresh perspective rather than coming from another sports betting business or another sports betting operator or someone else within that industry? Definitely. I, th- I think, And I think that would go for any industry. A fresh set of eyes and a fresh perspective is always going to be helpful. And, and certainly... If you're looking to disrupt an industry, as we are seeking to do with Sportstack, um, it's almost essential by definition. People that spend their time deeply within an industry for some time are always going to be blinded to potential opportunities out there. Um, and that's that's obviously been seen in finance and banking and fintech over the last five years very actively. Most of the kind of new startups and founders there have come from a different industry into that. So I think specifically for us, um, the understanding of financial markets and trying to create that maturity and bring that almost fintech angle into it has been really useful. Um, and I think most of the industry has been 
has really generated from an entertainment only perspective. Um, and whilst entertainment is, of course, at, at the moment, the core, the core, the fundamental approach of, of sports betting and gambling, and it, it should remain that way for some time. Um, I do think that to some extent prevents people from seeing innovation where we believe there can be some. And obviously that's what we're now trying to do. Um, saying that, I think in an industry like sports betting, which is from a technical perspective, quite complex, certainly from a marketing and user acquisition perspective, challenging and competitive, it is also a huge advantage to have expertise and um, experience within the industry itself. So I think that's where we were very conscious from the outset to build a team around sports betting and financial markets and not be all of one or one of the other. Um, so that's where we've really tried to cover both bases there and bring our brains together to to come up with the optimal solution. Yeah, that topic is a very interesting one. I'd love to get a deeper perspective from you. You certainly talked about the entertainment element of sports and how that sits. And also, I think earlier you were talking about the binary nature of the products in sports betting. And yeah. I guess that's just the way it's it's sort of evolved now. And when we talk about innovation in sports betting, sometimes we talk about you know, 350 markets or prop bets or derivatives on the three major elements of sports betting, which is who's going to win, by how much, and what's the total yeah. score or points going to be. So that seems to be the track of innovation generally. And there's obviously other elements that go into that. But I'd love to hear why you think things have evolved that way. And do you think things could change in the future where innovation might be and, and could be considered very different to creating 500 prop bets with a max <laughs> bet of about $25 yeah. and so on and so forth? Yeah, I completely agree. I think most of most of the what you refer to as innovation in the industry has been more kind of an en enhancement or a bolt on, in my opinion. The only real innovation, meaningful innovation, has been the introduction of exchanges, obviously led predominantly by Betfair. Betfair, we've met with a handful of others following ever since. That's been the kind of real game changing innovation within the industry with with everything else as minor kind of tweaks and enhancements and improvements to to the core underlying binary products as you mentioned so um i think the reality of why that has the markets evolved that way and why why it is such is because fundamentally to to have a bet on a sporting outcome or a bet on anything you need you need an objective outcome um, and the only way to really represent that is in a fixed odds or binary binary odds nature where me and you can decide to bet on something, whether it's, you know, what, what team's going to win. And at the end of the day, at the final whistle, we know exactly what the outcome is. And then we can settle a binary odd where one of us will win, win, win the money and one of us will lose all our money. So it's not a surprise that it's evolved down that path. But I think relating to what I said previously is kind of, our confusion as to why betting is just considered in such a negative light and such a negative connotation. I think it's this binary nature that really drags sports and betting to the very far extreme of the spectrum, well away from speculating on anything else. Um, if you've got kind of stock investing at one side, gambling is very much at the other, um, where it's almost ironic that speculating on virtual currencies and crypto coins is apparently not gambling. Um, whereas having kind of highly prudent opinions and trades on sporting outcome is still considered this negative association. So we were very conscious of addressing this binary nature, and that's why Sportstack, which we can get into, isn't binary betting, because we think ultimately the way the market is maturing and users are starting to mature as well is actually away from this notion of if I'm wrong or even slightly wrong, I just lose all of my money. Why can it not be that... If you're if you're really right, you'll make loads of money. If you're if you're a little bit right, you'll make a bit, and vice versa. If you're slightly wrong, okay, you'll lose 10, 20 percent of your stake. If you're really long, wrong, you might lose 50, 60 percent of your stake. But it's not this kind of winner takes all, loser loses all mentality, which is so pervasive in it, pervasive in gambling products. Um, and I think some of the products that are coming out now are starting to be cognizant of that fact and starting to explore this. And that's very much where we see the market and the products maturing to the space where people want to have a more dynamic and active experience with their betting and not simply get used to just losing a 10 or 20 pounds every week. Because let's face it, the statistics are public. Most of the time, people are just losing all their money. Yeah, no, and, and potentially, I'm certainly discounting the likes of uh, the, the high margin, sorry, the high volume, low margin sports books that do exist. Obviously, that business model is far 
more difficult to uh, to execute or you need deeper pockets, certainly. So that's probably one of the reasons why it isn't certainly widespread. And there's probably been many uh, startups and probably even failed businesses that have been innovative to a degree. But certainly what's caught on and what the uh, core business is today uh, hasn't been as innovative as some might have liked. And I guess along that line, I don't know much about the history of finance and when it can be said that it really started to ramp up. But in the online context, sports betting is probably only 10, 15, 20 years old in terms of it being a core function of the betting offering. Do you think as we go over the next 20, 25 years, things will rapidly evolve and change? Yeah, there's, there's absolutely no question in my mind that's the case. Um, we The way we kind of frame it in the office here, as sports stack is that sports betting is now at where kind of the stock and bond markets were at in the late eighties, early nineties, which for anyone that knows finance is when kind of online started to penetrate slightly. Um, and just the general evolution and, and liquidity within the markets just hit a completely new level and just took financial markets from an actually a fairly mundane and boring proposition to what it is today, which is kind of a Goliath of Goliath of, just of glo- of global markets, so we see no doubt that the penetration of um, of internet across the world, um, even mobile mobile, the data on mobile usage as well is crazy. Um, the opening up of the markets from a regulatory standpoint, not least in the U.S., which is of course a huge opportunity, which will continue to open over the next five to ten years. But even looking out east, the likes of India um, and elsewhere in Asia, there's so many users coming online or soon to come online that it's incredibly exciting um and and as the exchanges themselves continue to mature liquidity continues to increase um to some extent the industry continues to consolidate and stop fragment stop fragmenting so much liquidity uh, which is inevitable and happened in financial markets as well it really is going to follow a very similar path um and i think one of the most crucial pieces of this puzzle, which is starting to happen and could very well be led by the US market, um, given their different history within sports betting, is the perception of sports betting changing and for sports to be viewed as simply another speculative asset class as almost everything else is. Um, So I think the way we see it is because the UK has had such a long history of sports betting and we've had you know 50 years of retail betting shops on every street corner um, and the various kind of associations and connotations that go with that it still has this very negative stigma attached to it whilst in the us where it's essentially it's been entirely illegal for many decades outside of vegas um, people don't really have that negative connotation connotation to it and the way that they interpret and consume sports is on such a different level anyway that actually the way that uh, the consumer appetite in the US for taking risks, for trading, for participating in the stock market, etc., I think there's going to be far quicker take up into this kind of sports, speculative sports asset class mentality there. Um, and that's really where sports stack starts to come in, come into its own. And that's what we're, we're, we're engineering for. Yeah. And I certainly think that if you have a long term horizon for this, something like 25, 30 years, whether it is the US or any other jurisdiction, you can certainly see some of those upsides and benefits that today many would say, you know, it's never going to be an asset class, sports betting is not set up that way, so on and so forth. But I think a good example or illustration of that might be to take someone back to 2011 and have them bet in play or bet online or or go through a betting experience back then to see see how it's evolved from, you know, eight or nine years ago to now and how different it really is. So, Thinking on a more broad horizon, you can see that some of the pessimism that may exist now for the industry, uh, that some might say it's never going to get to a finance equivalent. I think there are robust reasons for that today. But I think if you do have a, a wider vision and, and have certainly optimism and executing certain elements, it's a, it can be a very optimistic outlook. But it, we, we could talk about that for hours. I want to get into sports stack. And, and can you just start very briefly, uh, for those that haven't, been on the website or understand exactly how it works just a bit of a uh, i guess a summary of what those people might want to hear about sports stack yeah sure so sports stack is a global sports exchange that will allow you to buy and sell shares in professional athletes to speculate on their performance so in essence we're making fantasy sports real 
And how we do that is we, for every sport, so we're launching in the UK with football as our first sport. Um, so focusing on football, we create a unique scoring table for every sport, which is similar to fantasy, fantasy football, in this case, fantasy football scoring. Um, and that'll clearly tell you how much a player will earn and lose based off various attributes that they can um, they can perform on the pitch so just you know just as an example you might earn 10, 10 pence for a goal 5p for an ex- assist minus 7p for a red card etc cetera, etc cetera. we create a scoring table for every sport and within a within every match a player can earn between zero pence and a hundred pence and what you are doing at sports stack on the sports stack exchange is speculating on how much value you think the player is going to earn in the game so at any point in time the the market price of a player is simply reflecting the market's best guess as to how much that player is going to earn in the match so if you believe they're going to earn more than 60p if that's what the price currently is then you will buy shares there and crucially if you think they're going to earn less than that you don't think they're going to have a great game you can actually sell them so one of the key usps that we enable is the ability to go short or lay a player um, in a very easy easy way so whilst on one hand we're simply making fantasy sports real and letting you monetize your opinion your fantasy sports opinions uh, which is a fairly easy translation what we also enable you to do, which you can't even do in a fantasy product or a gamification of the product, is we actually enable you to say, I think X player is overrated or I, I really don't like X player. I'm going to take a view that they're not going to play well and you can actually sell their shares on our exchange. So ultimately, throughout the week and in play, you can buy and sell shares in any player you wish um, just to speculate on how much you think they're going to earn. So this sounds like a very difficult build out and I guess launch from a startup perspective. Take us through some of the challenges you had to get this off the ground and some of the expertise that you've already talked about previously and some of the uh, the benefits of the co-founders. Was it a smooth enough process or have there been a lot of challenges? <laughs> well, I'd love to say it's been perfectly smooth, but of course, as you say, you know, this isn't the easiest thing in the world to build, but um, you know, it's very rewarding now that we have done. So we're actually launching in um in october so in just over a month's time and people will be able to be able to download be that be able to download the app in uh in mid-september um and the website's already up and running to sign up now so i mean the actual build itself we, we're lucky that we've got a very strong and experienced senior um te- technical team behind us at sports stack um i think the, the 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 two the two challenges have been one technical and two products generally. So from the technical side, clearly building an exchange from scratch and something that can handle very high levels of throughput um, and very low latencies, never going to be an easy task. Um, but as I say, I think our combined, the team's combined expertise coming from financial markets, which obviously operate at the immensely fast speed and the nuances of sports betting exchanges um, has really helped us deliver on that Um, and we've been very very focused on building everything ourselves in-house so we've built everything from scratch and own all our own ip uh, which with the potential exception of small kits is is not really something that's seen in the industry there's a lot of kind of bolt-ons and third-party software used by most of the most of the players in the industry but we've been very focused on owning everything ourselves and that's going to give us the ability to be incredibly scalable in terms of launching new sports and in new geographies, it's actually incredibly easy for us to do. All we really need to do is work out and decide our scoring table for that new sport. So if we want to launch NFL, we just need to create our own fantasy sports-esque model that values the various different things an NFL player can do. And then we can launch NFL player and NFL markets on our exchange very, very seamlessly. So that's been a real focus for us. Um, and it's been kind of just over a year of very very full-time work from the tech team to build the exchange to a point where it's ready to go in october um and ready to handle significant volumes and throughput from day one which obviously we can dream of um from day one you're never going to have perfectly perfect perfect markets but we do expect fairly significant volumes from day one um thanks to the conversations and, and partnerships we've made so we're very excited for that um i think the second the second challenge has been from a product itself. We've been very, very conscious of 
you know, the founding team of former financial markets background, a lot of people have tried and failed in the past to introduce a kind of markets based approach to sports betting and forgot that the majority of your users are going to be retail users that quite simply are used to using the major sports betting um, fixed odds bookmakers out there, or they're used to just doing very casually their sports betting or their fantasy sports teams. So we've been very conscious um, and careful to build a product that's very appealing and attractive to normal retail users and create an environment where they can really engage with and enjoy. Um, and certainly from a UI and UX perspective and the overall design, we've been very um, keen to innovate the what, what, what I believe is seen as the typical sports betting product in the UK, which in my mind, most of which kind of looks like it looks like and in some cases were designed in the kind of 1990s or early 2000s and still seems fairly out of date. So we've been very keen to kind of overhaul that and revolutionize the design and how we believe an app, an app should look and feel in this day and age. So we're very proud and happy with how the designs now look um, and how it how it feels. But actually, ultimately, all that matters is do your users enjoy your product and how much are they using it? So that's been the real, that's been a real focus of ours from the non-technical side of things. And that's obviously an ongoing process. And as we launch, we'll be looking to iterate and understand user feedback as quickly and actively as possible and make the necessary um, improvements that we need to, to continue to make sure we have the best product we can for them. Do you have an internal expectation around what a typical user experience might be or even just the user journey over a, let's say, a, a weekend of games where uh, they might be in and out of the app over a certain period of time or during a game they're well and truly in the app? Do you have a, a, a expectation from the outset? Well, there's, there's, there's two kind of user groups that we expect from day one to be very, very active on sports stack, And that's one is the kind of big fantasy sports fan that currently in a, in a completely free version, there's various fantasy football providers in the UK, whether it's from a media outlet or, you know, from the Premier League itself, that very casually make their team and it's all free and it's all fun. So we expect from that, for that, the kind of user journey we've created makes it incredibly easy for them to essentially just upload their fantasy sports team into sports stack and just define the stake that they want to do. So if they, put their 11 players that they've put in their fancy team into sports stack. They can just go, you know, pick tap the 11 players and place a 50 pound stake. And we do all the, we do all the clever stuff in the background and equally buy, um, equally buy the same amount of shares in the, in every player such that your exposure is 50 pounds. So that just very seamlessly allows someone to on a Friday when they're at the office and they've done their fancy team going, do you know what? I want to put 50 pounds on this team. I think I've got a great team. And then, you know, in a, in a matter of clicks, you can have that on sports stack. Um, and at the at the end of the weekend, just like you might do when you get back into the office on Monday, um, you see how many fancy points you won. You'll see how much is in your sports stack account and how how well your team did there. So that's very much the kind of passive approach for someone that's predominantly a fantasy fan that we ultimately see transitioning into a more active user. But from day one, that's one user case that we see. And then I think the second use case will be People that very actively bet on sports and bet on football already, um, obviously in a moment in fairly traditional um, binary odds markets, win lose draw markets, and and essentially what we're offering them is saying you know trade the player not the game. It's a completely new product line, a completely new exciting way of trading and consuming sports. When you think that majority of conversations between sports fans and sports pundits, pundits isn't really, I think Arsenal is going to win or I think Chelsea's going to lose, etc. It's normally, I think Harry Kane's overrated. I think Ozil's underrated, etc. Et I think Vardy's getting old. It's all kind of player-specific commentary and opinions. And ironically, you can't really express that in betting markets. But on Sportstack, you can. So we expect these users to much more actively be trading kind of rumors and training ground news throughout the week um, as the markets are obviously going to be fairly tame. And then once it gets in play, we expect people either to be holding sports stack in their hands as they're watching the game. And as, as you know, you see Harry Kane scoring a, a goal early in the match, desperately trying to buy, buy, buy his shares quickly is, is the expectation. 
quickly increases that he's going to have a great game and score a lot of points um, and vice versa. If you see someone looking like they're about to be subbed off, trying to sell sell them um, as you realize that their game's probably up. So we definitely feel that for those users, we're bringing a far more immersive experience with a, just a lot more going on, a lot more to get excited about than simply win, lose, draw matches. Well, and that's one of the most interesting aspects for me. And if anyone's played daily fantasy, whether it's in the US or or outside of the US, they'll they'll know that there's fixed salaries, which is a bit of a problem because that yeah. takes away a lot of the edge that you might have. Because everyone knows if a running back gets injured and the backup is one of the cheapest on the uh, on the list, then everyone's going to take that. Or you can't take that running back unless you have such a strong opinion that they're going to tank, and then you might be able to get an edge. But that's a very risky strategy in many respects. Or it's it's something that you know you've really got to think through. And and even if you don't like a key player, you can't lay essentially or short because you can't pick every running back outside of that running back i mean in horse racing even if you have an eight horse race and you hate one of the top three in the market you can kind of back all other seven if there was no laying um, and obviously betfair eliminates those types of problems but in fantasy and in a player specific environment those things to my knowledge today anyway don't really exist in a very simple yeah, there's no simple execution you can do that so i think that's going to be fascinating yeah exactly i just think that we Ultimately, to create a, a truly scalable exchange that we intend to do with Sportstack, we don't agree with these kind of gamifications where there's loads of rules, there's salary caps, you have to pick X defenders and Y strikers, et cetera, et cetera, on Sportstack. It's a pure player player exchange. You can just do whatever you want to do. Um, so if you've just got a really strong view that, that Harry Kane's going to have the best match of his career, then you can just go all in and buy as many shares as you like in him there. If you've got a more kind of portfolio approach where you want to almost put your fancy, fancy team in, you can do that. If you want to just say, if you just want to come into the app and say, I'm sick of everyone saying that Vardy's a genius. I disagree. I'm going to sell him. You can do that. So it's really up to you. And just like any other um, exchange or market, whether that's the stock market, crypto market, etc you can do whatever you please. Um, and that's what we're creating. And it was very much this transition from um, pure fantasy, which is free. DFS um, is obviously that stepping stone to in some way monetizing fantasy sports, but it's still a very much a gamification. We're just taking a step further and creating a, pro a full player exchange, um, which we think the market is, is ready for. And certainly the US market I believe is ready for today, but obviously from a regulatory perspective, we need to be um, cognizant of uh, timing that execution correctly with that. Um, so the regulation is moving in the right way um, and it is moving quickly, but these, these things take time, certainly for an exchange. So um, as you know, I'm in the, I'm in the U S at the moment. Um, we're having a lot of meetings with investors and um, kind of key stakeholders in the space. Uh, it's a very exciting place to be for sure. But um, it, it's going to take it's going to take some time, but we're certainly ready for it when it happens. Very interesting. And one quick question on the uh, the tables you mentioned, the scoring. How settled is that, or how how accurate do you think you have that in terms of it being the most optimal way to do it? Or are you looking at potentially after the after the EPL season, for example, looking at tweaking those things as you go? Yeah, so we're pretty happy with it. We've obviously looked at various other scoring mate. Um, scoring tables from various different providers and fantasy games, etc. That was that was a natural starting point for us, and we believe we've optimized it and taken in a lot of user feedback from from what people do and don't like about the relative value of various things. So we're pretty happy with it. What I forgot to mention, um, which relates to your second question, is that so what I described is the match market where you're speculating on how a player is going to do in you know this weekend's game or the current game if it's already in play. What we're shortly thereafter going to be launching is a season market where it's exactly, exactly the same concept where you're speculating on the performance of the player. But in a season market, you're speculating on how much they're going to earn over the entire season. So those markets are going to be open 24-7 all the way from the first game of the season to the last game of the season. So that's where it becomes much more of a kind of long-term sports exchange um, where you can genuinely start to invest and speculate in players in a similar way to you, that you might do in very various other asset classes. So the reason we're launching with match markets before we launch season markets is exactly your point. So if we get user feedback 
um, that that indicates that we should slightly tweak and iterate our scoring model, then we will absolutely do that. And when we're happy that it's good to go and it's something that we can we can hold up for you know, a longer period of time, then we'll launch a season market where obviously once you launch a season market and people start to build positions based off a set scoring table, you can't then go and change the scoring table because that might completely hurt some users that built a position based off the scoring being as it is. So we've been very conscious to focus on match markets to start with. Um, one, because it's just a very easy transition for a lot of sports betting and fantasy users anyway. Um, but two, it gives us that opportunity to assess the scoring model we create um, and then iterate it as we need. But then ultimately, once the season market is launched, then that scoring table will be fixed for the whole season. Yeah, very interesting. So I'm going to give you a ridiculous, very long, long term example, and it, you might be able to dismiss it very quickly or it might be something we can laugh about. But if I'm thinking 10, 15, 20 years down the line with Sportstack, if I'm a 19 year old player playing in the Bundesliga at Stuttgart or one of these, you know, not Bayern Munich, but one of the lower teams, and I am playing really well in the early part of the season, and I'm looking to be transferred or probably will be transferred to a top-tier team in, let's say, Spain, um, will I be able to eventually transfer hedge my position and say, look, I'm going to make this much money uh, in case I get injured or in case my performance drops off and my uh, potential amount of money I'm going to make at the end of the season or during a transfer window can I hedge the downside if that was something that was allowed? And there's obviously a million different possible avenues I could take, but is that something one day that we're going to see? <laughs> I mean, I mean, first of all, I guess I have to say that it's illegal for professional athletes to bet on themselves or bet on their own sports from a regulatory perspective. No, I think theoretically, if the markets get as mature as we believe they can and will, then yes, um, ultimately, the season markets of any athlete will reflect a very true indication of their performance, um, such that in theory, you could you could as a hedge against your own poor performance in that sense. So as I say, you wouldn't ever be able to do that as an athlete. And we would obviously, from day one, are taking every case to a you know KYC and understand our users such that nobody would ever be able to abuse the system. Um, or abuse the markets for any for any malintent, um, but in theory, yeah, that's exactly that's exactly where we see the maturity of these markets going. Um, and we've been able to successfully trademark the term "sportfolio," so a sports sport portfolio. Um, so you can that's why we're we're building our brand around this term of build your sportfolio at Sportstack. Because ultimately, once we launch across many sports, we believe that your overhit majority of sports punditry in conversation with your mates or your colleagues will be who's in your portfolio. I'm long Tiger Woods. I'm short Harry Kane. I'm long Lewis Hamilton. I'm short Tom Brady, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe that much as people might talk about whether do you own Bitcoin or not, or do you own Apple stock or whatever, people will ultimately start to talk about sports in these frameworks as well. Um, and that's really where we see the evolution and the maturity of the market going over the next 10 years. Yeah, you shut you shut down my dumb example pretty well, but I think I was trying to relate it back to, um, for example, if you're a season ticket holder in any sport and you're expecting to have your team make a playoff game or a semi final or whatever it might be, a final even, and you're holding a, a ticket to that game, that ticket might be worth two thousand um, dollars. You know, some people would say, okay, well, in the game preceding that to enter the final game, I can probably bet on the other team to win so that if they do win, I win that bet and I obviously lose the value in my ticket that I'm holding for a seat of the game. And there are those different hedging opportunities that do and can happen. So yeah, for I think sure. moving forward on a player specific level, it's, it's an interest, interesting one. Definitely. And I, and there's various, there's various um, kind of cross pollinations that we're likely to see even from inception, people that are people that are, active in first goal scorer markets for example can be backing them as they currently do on various exchanges or with bookmakers and then just selling that player on sports stack yeah. as a hedge because yeah. you know there's so we I mean the, we're already having a lot of conversations with 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 um users that are talking about the product in that sense and certainly from a more professional standpoint a lot of people already have significant analysis and data on player performance but currently they can't really do that much with it other than use it to trade the second derivative, which is who's going to win the game. So we're creating, we've, we're providing this huge outlet for people that have um, a lot of, essentially have a lot of demands to express opinions on players. And we're pr providing the exchange for them to do that. 
So, Nick, before I let you go, I just want to ask if, if you're a user, I guess you have to be in the UK or you can tell us exactly the jurisdictions, but once you're up and running and you're live, what would you tell just the general user that would be interested or listening to this and think that would be cool to give, a, give it a shot? What's the best way for them to do that once you're up and running? Um, yes, yeah, so we are launching in the UK and then we'll be in Europe from um, f- from next summer. It's obviously the Euros next summer, which will be up in certain European jurisdictions for. But as of October, when we launch, uh, we'll be in the UK. So um, you can go to sportstack.com right now and sign up um, and get access to our to our early beta markets, which are going to be live in two weeks time. Um, and then from there, you'll be able to download the app as well. So we're going to have both. We're going to be both web and app enabled. Um, so for now, head over to the website, and that will give you um, all the information and some nice examples um, and more information generally there. And that's probably the best place to get started. Um, and then people are free to email me if they're listening to this as well. Just nick at sportstack.com. Always happy to speak to people and answer questions, etc. There as well. Awesome, Nick. Thank you very much for your time. I certainly wish you well. I'm sure it's going to capture the attention of the industry once it gets rolling. And certainly if the liquidity is there, it's going to be a very interesting concept over the years. So uh, hopefully it works very well for you and you can bring it to the US and then uh, the world is your oyster. Exactly, Jake. That's the plan. Thanks so much.